We are in the middle of a theme called The Way to the Beyond, for the benefit of all. We've had a couple of weeks which have been unusual weeks because we had um, Rat Naguna as a guest speaker last week and we had Mistress Ceremonies the week before. So I'm just going to do a little bit of a brief recap just to remind us of where we've got to so far with the theme. So you remember that what we're looking at is um, a very, very beautiful, sublime ideal from a Buddhist perspective called the Bodhisattva ideal. And a Bodhisattva is a, a being of enlightenment. Bodhi means enlightenment, Sattva means being. But there's something particularly um, significant about the, this, the Bodhisattva, which is they are practicing to gain enlightenment, not just for themselves, but to benefit all people, for all beings to benefit, and all beings to become enlightened. So it's a really altruistic, um, yeah, you could say, yes, yeah, it's the most sublime human ideal from a, a Buddhist perspective. And yeah, we, we, have, we had a couple of talks giving the background to this, the kind of historical background, the context. And we've started to look at a list that's called the 10 paramitas, the 10 ways to the beyond, the 10 perfections. And it's the way that a bodhisattva practices to become a bodhisattva. They're practicing to become perfect in generosity, perfect in ethics and so on. And over the next the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at each of these paramitas in turn and just exploring how a bodhisattva practices in this altruistic way um, in each of these different areas. Ratnaguna talked last week about how, yeah, a bodhisattva practices these paramitas and encourages other people to practice them. That's an aspect of a bodhisattva's practice. And also, um, through practicing these paramitas, they become more beautiful which I, I was very inspired by this. Not as, it said it wasn't a physical, youthful beauty, but a kind of more true, deeper beauty, an ethical beauty. And um, yeah, Bodhisattva becomes more beautiful through practicing the, the Paramitas, but also brings beauty into the world. So that's what you know, we're seeking to do. It's what we, we're seeking to explore over this, um, you know, the next few weeks and months on this theme. And we've also been using a, a text. We will be using a text as a companion, a guide to this, Theme. And it's a text called the Bodhi Chari Avatara, which is translate, could translate as a, bo- a guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. So it's a guide to how to practice as a Bodhisattva to practice this path. Um, so what we'll be doing is each week we'll often be quoting using very inspiring verses from this text, which was composed in about the 8th century by a, a very famous Buddhist called Shantideva. So, so far, we've introduced the theme, we've introduced the list, and we've spent a couple of weeks looking at generosity. And tonight, we're going to move on to ethics, shield or ethics. So I'm going to um, talk about that, and next week, Vidanya's also going to talk about the practice of ethics, shield. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on what Shantideva especially has to say about this. So there's various chapters in, in Shantideva's book, The Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And the two chapters around ethics, they focus specifically on mindfulness. So you might think, okay, well, why, why does Shantideva focus on mindfulness in particular? And there's two reasons. The first is a kind of practical reason that a lot of the other, the other five precepts get covered through the other parameters or through other aspects of his books. There's a whole section on generosity, for example. Um, so, yeah, so ethics does, the other, the other precepts are the five precepts apart from mindfulness, get covered in other parts of it. But also you could say, well, m- mindfulness is the, is the kind of gateway, it's the, the basis for ethical practice. Um, if there's no awareness, if there's no mindfulness, we can't keep the other precepts. So Shantideva really goes into this, he goes into well, how mindfulness is the, the way into the other, the other precepts, how it's the key to practicing ethics. So for example, as Shantideva says in his text, If we don't keep our mindfulness, what will happen to all our other vows and precepts? Just as a sick man isn't fit for any work, so a distracted mind can't do anything useful. So, yeah, in a sense, if we don't keep up our mindfulness, we don't practice mindfulness, if we have a distracted mind, well, we can't remember to practice our vows and our precepts. It's as simple as that, really. Yeah, I, I really... I really love the uh, text, The Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, and it's full of inspiring verses. It's also full of imagery and simile and metaphors, and they really work for me. And Shantideva uses um, 
yeah, two two similes that I want to draw out for um, for our mind and working with our mind. So the first is drawn out in this verse. He's trying to say it's just not possible to practice the Dharma without keeping a careful guard on the mind, which wanders so easily. The wandering mind is like an untamed elephant, and it causes more havoc. So yeah, he uses the image of, of taming our mind. The mind is like a wild <coughs> elephant. So if, we, if we're acting unskillfully, if we're acting unethically, it's like and it's just a wild animal, a wild elephant causing havoc in our lives and in other people's lives. And he, he says we need to tame our mind, we need to tame this wild elephant of a mind which causes so much havoc. And the other verse, the other, the other image he uses, well, I'll read the verse, he says, when we tame our mind, we tame all threats and problems, because all suffering and fear come from the mind. This is the Buddha's teaching. We can't cover the whole world in leather, but if we put leather on the soles of our feet, it has the same effect. We can't, put, we can't cover the whole world in leather, leather, but if we put leather on the soles of our feet, it has the same effect. I, you know, I really love this, this uh, image. This, this, yeah, it's a great image. So you, if you use your imagination and put yourself in the time of Shantideva, so he's in, in India, um, even in today, actually, you don't need to be in ancient India. Last week, about it was 51 degrees um, Celsius in India. My is over there at the moment, kind of sweating profusely, probably, but it's 51 degrees. And um, so, if you imagine you're, work, you're walking barefoot around India, well, sometimes your feet's going to come into contact with all kinds of different experiences. You know, sometimes you're going to be treading on very nice, soft, dusty sand, sometimes spiky stones, sometimes burning hot ground. And yeah, and that's going to cause you know, all kinds of responses. You can have really yeah, painful experiences and some pleasant experiences on the soles of your feet. And Shanti Davis says, well, in the same way, our mind is constantly coming into contact with different experiences, different surroundings, different circumstances, different situations, all around this external, different, different circumstances. Some of these are going to be comfortable and pleasant. Some of these are going to be painful and unpleasant. And what we try and do is we try and control the circumstances, we try and control, we try and tame the circumstances, we try and tame the world in the way, the outer world, we try and manage it, control it. And Shanti Davis says, well, this is equivalent to trying to cover the whole world in shoe leather so that we always get a comfortable, you know, a comfortable um, foot, you know, foot, whatever, step, would be the right word, wouldn't it? Comfortable footstep. Um, yeah, our approach to trying to control our suffering is like this, we try and just manage our environment, we try and think of everything we can, control everything we can to reduce suffering. But in, in a way it's impossible, it's as foolish as trying to cover the whole world in leather. We can't, we can't manage the outer circumstances, we can't control it. And even if we could, it's not the route to happiness. So, so Shanti Davis says, well if, well, if we tame our mind, we tame suffering. It's our mind that can wreak havoc like a, a wild elephant if it's untamed. But if we can tame our mind, then we can tame all our experiences of uh, psychological suffering, of pain, psychological pain. And it says, yeah, it's, it's, our, it's our mind, it's our mind which, we, which determines our experiences. And you could say, yeah, we can't control our outer experiences, our outer circumstances, but we can control our mind, we can control our responses, we can control our mental states, we can control our, our behaviour, and that leads to um, the, the way we experience the world. So you'll notice I've got up from the beginner's course this flip chart that says actions, personality, world. And yeah, we, we live in our states of mind actually. Most of the time we live in our states of mind and it's our states of mind that determine whether we suffer or not. You know, we can live in a, a very dark state of mind and the world seems a very negative place. We can live in an angry state of mind and the world's full of conflict and aggression. Or we can live in a really beautiful, calm space of mind and the world's full of beauty. So more often than not, we live in our states of mind. And there's a relationship between our states of mind and ethics, which is the parameter that I'm going to be talking about. And that relationship is karma, the law of karma. So you remember that we've got lots of different strands in our being. It's as though you, you can, we experience it so there's lots of different impulses, lots of different strands in our being. And if we've got an untrained mind, like a wild elephant, then our mind is a reactive mind. And um, you know, if we act, yeah, if we've got a mind that's selfish, greedy, uh, dishonest, distracted, um, 
yeah, we're going to create that's a, that's an un, a, a wild untamed mind. I'll just put this next flip chart on. See. Jog your memory. So you remember we've got a reactive mind and a creative mind, and it's the unethical, habitual, reactive mind which is un, untrained that needs to be tamed. Yeah, and we tame our mind by taming these selfish strands, unethical strands, and by not acting out on the stingy impulses, the jealous impulses. So we need to rein in this habitual reactive mind. And that frees us to act more creatively, to act from a place of love, from kindness, from metta. So there's another verse which is beautiful, I'll come back to this later, but just to give you a sense of, well, if we do manage to tame this kind of selfish, habitual reactive mind, what kind of mind can be possible from a Bodhisattva's perspective? So Shantideva says, having mastered our lower nature in this way, we should give up frowning and always have a smiling face, being the first to greet and talk to other people, a friend to the universe. We should speak kindly and look straight at people's faces as if drinking them in with our eyes. <coughs> so I'll come back to that later. I think it's a very beautiful expression of how we can act from meta if we can tame our mind, tame these kind of habitual stingy, selfish impulses, we can really cultivate a very, very uh, warm, loving, friendly mind. Okay. So the way we tame our mind and our reactive mind is through mindfulness. So the, the gateway to practicing in a creative, ethical way is through mindfulness. And we'll, so you'll remember that we can create a gap in this wheel, a gap in our reactive mind where we can choose and we can act in a creative, ethical way. And the way we do that is through the practice of mindfulness, and that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this evening. How to practice mindfulness. What is it, and how do we practice it? So, um, I, just out of interest, I put the word mindful, or the two words, mindfulness book, into Amazon just to see what came up. And there was 76, not 76 books, but 76 pages of results for mindfulness book. There were 7,000 results the term mindfulness book in Amazon. So I didn't look at all of the results, I just looked at the first few. And so there's all kinds of different um, types of mindfulness, but there was mindfulness, a practical guide to finding peace, the little book of mindfulness, the ladybird book of mindfulness, the mindfulness colouring book, the mindfulness guide for the frazzled, mindfulness in eight weeks, mindfulness for anxiety relief, mindfulness for health, creative mindfulness, the Mindfulness Journal, Mindfulness for Women, Mindfulness for Beginners, yeah, and so on. So there's lots of different, well, basically, people are milking mindfulness is what I, the sense I get. It's very, very popular. And then um, you know, there's lots of different ways, books, you know, guides you can buy to mindfulness. So what is it? And what is it really? And how do we practice it? So I googled, I just typed into Google mindfulness definition to see what the the popular definition of mindfulness. And often what you encounter is uh, a definition by a really key um, pioneer of mindfulness, popular mindfulness practice called John Kabat-Zinn. And his definition is that it's mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. I'll say that again. Mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So, yeah, there's, yeah, mindfulness is very, very, very popular. And what most people um, think of when they use the word mindfulness is, is this. It's, it's being in the moment, being in the present moment with a kind of non-judgmental response. Um, so, yeah, there's a word for that, in a Buddhist term for this, because uh, Buddhism had mindfulness quite a long time before um, Lady Bird did. Um, the Buddhist word for this type of mindfulness, for being in the present moment, is um, the Pali word is sati, and um, the Sanskrit word is smirti. So I'm, I'm mixing up my Pali and Sanskrit here a bit, but forgive me for that. This is Pali word for sati. And that is the very, that's the popular definition of mindfulness, being in the moment, being in the present moment. So it's a very pleasant state of being absorbed of what you're doing, being focused on what you're doing. Um, a sense of spaciousness, it can lead to a sense of contentment. 
they're really being with your experience. And the opposite of this is to be distracted, to be split, trying to do lots of different things at the same time, um, flitting between tasks, having a kind of superficial attention, which isn't really with what's happening, isn't really fully with what's happening. Uh, it could be described as like a butterfly man that just kind of flits from one thing to the other, always on the surface of things, never really able to focus and concentrate, be contented. And interestingly, you asked, you know, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with both a mindful mind and a distracted mind. And I was, trying, I was just writing this section on, on Sati and I noticed that I started to drift off and think about a conversation I just had in the tea room. And then I started to think about um, yeah, something else related to the conversation. I ended up getting into a, some kind of fantasy, actually, kind of almost sexual fantasy based on the conversation I'd had in the tea room. And then I thought, oh, I'm supposed to be writing about Sati and being, <laughs> being distracted and being in the present moment. So this happens all the time. Which, you know, we're even trying to practice mindfulness, doing the mindfulness of breathing. You end up thinking about one thought, then another thought, and then another thought. And you end up um, just miles away from where you started. I'll be talking more about this later, but there's a term called Prapancha, which is really important. And this is, it illustrates this dynamic where you start off with one thought, then you, another thought arises, and then another, and you just end up um, proliferating lots of different thoughts and stories. It's called Prapancha, mental proliferation, or stories, really. And I'll, uh, I'll come back to that. So I'm going to explore different types of mindfulness. I want to give some uh, practical examples. I mean, I've already just given one, but some other practical examples of... Um, yeah, I gave a talk last year on the parents' retreat about mindfulness, the, the fifth precept of mindfulness, and, and different types of mindfulness. And the example I gave for trying to practice sati as a parent was that, um, yeah, I'm basically going home on a Monday night, I go home from the Buddhist centre for my dinner and then I come back for a class again. So I've got about an hour and a half where I go home and I see my wife and my son. And basically, I just find it really, really jarring because it's just a completely different energy I go home and it's very chaotic. My son's kind of full of energy. Well, a lot of people might have encountered my son on um, Sunday at Buddha Day and so you'll know what, what he was like. He basically was, he was running around the shrine screaming for about 15 minutes on <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> So it's a very different energy from when I'm usually at the Buddhist centre. I go home and I encounter Robert and my wife Lucy. She's often trying to feed him. He doesn't want to be fed. Um, and what I really would like to do is just be really fully present with them. I've got an hour and a half with them. I just really like to be fully present and fully available for them. But unfortunately, what often happens is I just find it kind of so jarring that I just end up trying to distract myself. So I'm kind of you know, partly paying attention to what's going on, partly looking at my phone. I get my phone out and you know, just think, OK, well, I just need to distract myself in some way. So, it's, yeah, and, and what I would like to do is be able to, in that situation, is just to be really, really fully present um, with Robert and Lucy. And, yeah, it could just be, looking after Robert can be very stressful. I can find myself getting anxious because it, it becomes like a list of things I need to do. I need to get him fed. I look after him in the mornings and on Fridays. So I need to get him fed. I need to get him washed. I need to get him uh, his nappy changed. I need to get him ready to go to nursery. I need to get him to nursery or I need to... There's a whole list of things I need to do throughout the day. It becomes a bit like a checklist. And, um, yeah, I think I can live, rather than living in the moment, enjoying being with Robert, I can just live in a state of anxiety sometimes or a state of mild kind of stress. Um, so in our society, anxiety is also very popular. Mindfulness is very popular. Anxiety is also very popular. And um, I think maybe this is why this version of mindfulness is so popular, being in the moment. It's the opposite of kind of being distracted and being anxious, just being calm, being with what's happening. Yeah, that version of mindfulness is very, is very popular. Um, but being with your experience non-judgmentally isn't the full story. Being present with your experience isn't the full story of mindfulness. So a cat is very present with their experience. Um, a frog is very po probably very present and in the moment with that experience. A bank robber is probably really, really present, really, really absorbed in what's happening. Um, so, for, you know, you could have the experience of being really with your emotions, really with what's happening and saying, oh, yeah, I'm very mindful, I'm quite angry right now. Oh, yeah, I'm very mindfully punching my friend Fred in the face. Um, and clearly, we need to make judgments. We do need to make judgments about our mental states and about the decisions about how we act. So it can be a bit misleading to say, you know, mindfulness is non-judgmental, can be misleading, because clearly we need to make 
decisions, actually some mental states are going to be going to cause harm and some mental states are going to be um, you know, beneficial. And we need to, we need to distinguish, we need to make a choice, we need to judge between the two. Um, so there, um, yeah, I think perhaps the, the focus on non-judgmental in John kabat definition is probably because we have, a lot of us have such a negative self-view, we can end up giving ourselves a hard time for what thoughts arise. So, we, you know, there's a focus on just not judging ourselves what happens, but we really need to do, we really need to distinguish and judge and make decisions about the, the harmful and beneficial states of mind that are arising and what we want to cultivate in a way, which strands of our being do we want to put energy behind and which do we want to move away from. We do need to make a clear judgment, a clear distinction. So this is where the practice of ethics and the gap comes into the wheel of life. You know, we, um, you know, we can be very, very mindful with our habitual situation, but then we need to decide to do something else. So there's a, a second type of mindfulness, which hopefully you can see, called apamada. This is the Sanskrit word for apamada. The Pali is apamada, without the R. And this is another word from Buddhist tradition that also gets translated as mindfulness. So you'll hear the word mindfulness, and it could be sati, it could be apamada. And um, so it's quite confusing. It means something very different to sati. It doesn't mean being in the, in the present moment non-judgmentally. Um, apamada is more like vigilance, an ethical vigilance, guarding the mind, guarding the gates of your senses, guarding your mind. So being really vigilant about what you allow into your mind, what you allow out of your mind. Um, so it's about choosing. If, if sati is about noticing what's happening, apamada is about choosing what you want to do in response to that. So it's which strands do you want to act on, which strength and strengthen which are really going to cause suffering, which are going to cause grief, and which are going to cause happiness and joy. So apamada is where in the moment you catch, you catch your impulse or you catch that train of thought and you say, no, I'm not going to follow that. This is going to be harmful. I'm going to unhook from that. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to, the, you know, back to the present moment or I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to make an ethical choice to do something different. So Shantideva has another image for this, which... Um, needs some unpacking, a little bit of unpacking. But he, Shanti Deva says we should be like a block of wood in that situation. So I'll read what he says. When the mind is inflated or critical, full of arrogance, intoxicated, evasive, dishonest, when it looks down on or blames other people, we should remain like a block of wood. So what does he mean? So I think basically what he's saying is that a block of wood doesn't do anything. It doesn't act. It, you know, it's, it's motionless, isn't it, a block of wood? It doesn't do very much. Um, yeah, blocks, that's what blocks of wood tend to do, not, not very much. So in that situation, if you find your mind is, you know, it's got an impulse to be dishonest or an impulse to be greedy or jealous or cruel, and you catch it, basically the first thing you need to do is just nothing. You need to not act on it. You know, just be like a block of wood internally, emotionally. Just don't act on it. Don't do the thing that you impulsively want to do. Don't kick the cat. Don't shout at your partner, don't take the last bun, like you, you know, you've already had three, whatever it is, don't eat the whole bar of chocolate, whatever it is that you want to do, and you catch yourself, don't do it, that's apamada, it's this real vigilance to stop, say no, don't do it. Um, and so, yeah, I think hearing about being a block of wood, it could, you know, there's a mis it could be slightly misleading, it could have the sense of being a little bit quite tense, actually, and kind of almost a bit unresponsive. And it's not, it's not saying that you need to be a relaxed block of wood, kind of just stay <laughs> relaxed, but just don't, don't act out the impulse. You know, don't act out what you want to act out. It doesn't mean to like, do nothing at all, just kind of, people think it's a bit weird, don't you? Go, What's going on with Bodhinaga? Like a block of wood. <laughs> I think what Shantideva was getting at is just you don't, you don't react, you, do, you catch yourself and you stop yourself. And, but because habits are built on lots and lots of momentum, it can take... And then over a very long time, and as Ratna Guna was saying last week, even over many lifetimes, we've built up our habits. Um, you have to keep a sustained vigilance. You have to practice apamada repeatedly. So, you know, it doesn't, you don't just have to catch yourself once and stop yourself once. The situation will keep arising. The habit will keep arising. So over time, you need to keep saying no to that strand in your being. And eventually, over time, it will weaken. It will die away. But it can take a lot of sustained practice of apamada. An example is the example I gave on the parents' retreat about practicing apamada at home. 
Robert was a bit younger then, it was last year. And he was in a phase of, which he was in for a long time, waking up multiple times in the night, four times, five times, six times in the night. Sometimes it was like an hour or half an hour in between. And I would wake up and then my immediate impulse was to feel angry, to feel resentful, you know, if it's my turn to go. And um, well, there's two things I talked about in the parents' retreat. One was pretending I was asleep, <laughs> which is a bit naughty. So I just kind of lie there, think, I don't want to go and see Robert, I'm going to pretend to be asleep, and then hope that Lucy would go and see Robert instead of me, because I just couldn't face going to see him. But if I was feeling a bit more generous, I had some kind of generous strands there as well, I think, okay, well, I'm going to try and go. But also, there'd be a strand of anger or resentment, kind of just, why can't you sleep? You know, just please be quiet. And it's put almost straight away thinking, okay, no, I can't, I can't. By the time I get into my son's bedroom, I can't be acting from that mental state. I can't be responding to him from that place of anger or resentment. You know, I can't, I need to, by the time I've got from my bedroom to his bedroom, I need to be responding from meta. So there's a real practice of just stopping myself, noticing that's, that's my that mental state is anger, resentment, and I need to stop it, check it, and respond from a place of meta. So that's, yeah, so we, have, we need to practice vigilance in the moment, you know, we, and so we need to make a judgment, and we need to be really vigilant in the moment. This is Akamada. We also need to be vigilant about um, conditions, actually. So we, we find a lot of our habits get produced by the same situations we put ourselves in. We put ourselves in the same situations, the same habitual responses, the same patterns, the same dynamics arise. So we need to be really vigilant about the situations we put ourselves in and what's going to happen. So we need, so was, um, Shantideva said, it's just like a wounded man in the middle of a rough crowd guards his wound with great care. We need to guard our mind in bad company. The determined practitioner who keeps this attitude can never be broken, even in the worst company. So I guess it's what it's saying is, well, sometimes we might put ourselves in situations where we're more likely to be unethical or, or you know, we're more likely to find ourselves gossiping, more likely to find ourselves getting drunk, more likely to find ourselves whatever it is that we, we do in some situations. And in those situations, we need to be vigilant. We just It's like we need to really guard our ethics, guard our mind in those situations, be vigilant. As if we've got, you know, we're in a crowd and we've got a wounded arm, we need to really guard our ethics. So that's the image that Shantideva uses. And these are these two aspects of Akamada. So we've got the Sati being in the present moment, being really fully with what's happening. You've got Akamada, which is being vigilant about you know, how you act, how you think, what, what you allow to, what strands you act on and what you don't, being vigilant about your conditions as well. Um, but there's a third, a third type of mindfulness as well. So all these terms are translated as mindfulness and the three separate Sanskrit terms and Pali terms. So incidentally, apamada, so there's often, for example, you'll hear the Buddha's final words translated as with mindfulness, strive on. Actually, what the Buddha said was, I can't remember the Pali, but something like apamadena, sampa, something. But it may meant with ethical vigilance, strive on. So the Buddha used the word apamada and in his final words to his disciples. He was really encouraging them to be really ethically vigilant and to make effort. But it gets translated as mindfulness. And so for most people, that might just be be in the moment. So you can see how actually there's different terms and they mean very different things, but they're all aspects of mindfulness. The final one, Sampajana, is, uh, can be translated as being mindful of your purpose, being mindful of what you're about, being mindful of your vows that you've made, being, you know, keeping that in mind. You could say, well, mindfulness really is easy to practice, but it's just very, very difficult to remember. It's really difficult to remember to be mindful. And Sampajana is a cultivating um, a mindfulness of what you're about, what you've committed to, what your purpose is. Um, and you can do this a practice of reflecting on the person you'd like to become, um, bringing that to mind, cultivating that sense of where you want to move to, who you want to become. So that, that informs the decisions, the ethical decisions, decisions you make. So you, you might recognise this from week three of the beginners course, where we say to people, who do you admire? Who do you want to be like? Um, who, who, what kind of person do you want to behave like? And people come up with a person you want to behave like. And then from there, you can work backwards and make decisions about your ethical choices, how you're going to decide, how you're going to behave in the moment. If you're not going to do the reactive thing, 
how you're going to behave to become more like the person you could be. So sampajana means keeping in mind who you want to become, bringing them to mind, thinking, well, how do I, how, what, what do I value about this person? What, who do I want to become? Um, <clears throat> and it also means bringing to mind what you're about, in a way, what you're committed to, you know, what you, the vows you've made in the past and who you want to become in the future. So, yeah, there's some ways I, I spoke about this on the parents' retreat. I said, well, you know, I need to remember now that I'm a parent. I can't, I've got responsibility. I can't do a lot of the things I used to want to do. So sometimes an impulse arises, oh, I'll, I'll go and watch the football on Sunday, I'll go out with some friends, or I'll go, go on this retreat, or I'll go on this order event. I said, oh, I can't because I'm a parent now, I've got responsibility. But also, as a kind of deeper purpose, a deeper commitment I need to bear in mind, which is I'm a Buddhist parent, and that informs the decisions I make as well. So, you know, for example, I'll think, okay, well, yeah, I need to act in a particular way in response to my child, which is ethical, because that's, they're the commitments I've made. There are going to be certain things, decisions I make about my child's upbringing, which will be different because they're informed by my commitment to, to Buddhism, to the Buddhist path. So an example I gave of this is Christmas time, where I really my preference, and I come into conflict a bit with this with my in-laws a bit, where they just, the first Christmas for Robert, they bought 40, 50 presents for him, something like this. It was just ridiculous, really. Very, very generous, but just way over the top. And I'm also, I've got, you know, it's a conflict of values because they see that as being, you know, very, very generous and important for Robert to express their love. But for me, I want to kind of help him to have a content life, to be kind of really appreciate what he's got, to have a simple life, to kind of really not grow up wanting loads of stuff. And so, yeah, as a Buddhist parent, I come into conflict with, you know, some of the ideals of the world. But then there's also a deeper layer of commitment, which I need to keep in mind, which I'm a Buddhist. I'm a, an ordained Buddhist who happens to be a parent. And that's a kind of deeper level of commitment for me. So there's times when I make decisions out of that deeper level of commitment that bring me into conflict with being a parent, actually. So there's times when I say, okay, well, because I'm committed to... Um, the Buddhist path, I'm ordained on the Buddhist path, I'm going to go on this particular retreat or I'm going to teach this particular class when, you know, it would be better for my son to have me around more often, you know, he might from his perspective. So there's going to be, there's conflicts in terms of being a parent and being a, a Buddhist. So for me, I mean, this is how I try to illustrate San Pajana. So what are you about? How are you going to make decisions? What's at the kind of centre of your life? What are you really about? What's your purpose? What's really important to you and how... Um, yeah, how that informs your kind of akamadi, your vigilance, or what decisions you're going to make. And just to kind of clarify, qualify what I was saying about going away on retreat, which is that in the short term, you know, it is going to be painful for me and Robert, but hopefully also really beneficial to him because I come back and, yeah, I am able to operate from a place of metta and I don't operate from a place of resentment or anger. So he will experience loads and loads of benefits and fruits from me going away on retreat. But at the same time, you know, it's painful for us both that there's that separation. So these are all different types of mindfulness. Um, yeah, you can be, mindfulness means being in the moment, it means being vigilant about your decisions, and it means bring, bearing in mind, keeping in mind your goal, your purpose, who you want to become. They're all types, different types of mindfulness. <clears throat> okay. So there's another Buddhist list. There's lots of Buddhist lists. I'm experimenting with using printouts because I think I was hoping that you might be able to hear, see it more clearly. Can you see the list from the back? <coughs> kind of. Um, so, is it, this is an amendment to a traditional Buddhist list. This is a list from Sangha to call the Four Dimensions of Awareness. So, yeah, there's a traditional Buddhist list from the Buddha which is to be mindful of your body. I'll explain what these terms are Vedana, Chitta, and reality. And Sangha actually to broaden that out to say, well, you can be aware of self, others, the environment, and reality. So I'm just going to briefly explore how practicing these four dimensions of awareness, what that looks like. So we've kind of heard why mindfulness is important. We've heard about what it is, what it means. How do you practice it? How do you practice mindfulness moment to moment? So yeah. What I would say is actually, in terms of Sampajana and keeping 
your goal in mind. For me, a really, really good way of doing this is to bring the Buddha to mind. So for order members, we, what we do is we each meditate on an archetypal figure that kind of represents enlightenment to us, it represents the goal to us. So we spend a lot of time reflecting on the, the goal embodied in a human being. And that's a way of just keeping in mind, almost like you're in the presence of enlightenment, you're in, present, in the presence of the Buddha or a particular Buddha, Buddha figure. So on Sunday we had the Buddha Day Festival, and that's what Buddha Day was all about. It's about Sampajana. It's about reflecting on the example of the Buddha, the life of the Buddha, the qualities of the Buddha, and how we can be more like that, how being, becoming inspired to become more like that. So we, we deliberately bring to mind the Buddha, the image of the Buddha, the example of the Buddha, or somebody that might be take the place of the Buddha for you, that kind of means more than you if the Buddha doesn't do that. And... Yeah, there's a, a, a verse from Shantideva which I think just captures somebody who really practices mindfulness. So it could be the Buddha, it could be somebody who's extremely mindful like the Buddha. But Shantideva says, when we're out and about, we shouldn't be looking around dis distractedly. We shouldn't be looking around distractedly. We should stay mindful of our purpose, aware of our body, and should constantly observe our mind. Before moving or speaking, we should examine our mind and then act appropriately and with self-possession. So for me, this describes somebody who's just really, really beautifully mindful. So it could be the Buddha, it could be somebody else, but basically you stay mindful of your purpose, aware of your body, constantly observing your mind, and before moving or speaking, examine your mind, and then act appropriately with self-possession. And it's said that, you know, I talked earlier about a distracted mind could be seen like a butterfly mind that just kind of flits from flower to flower, from kind of thought to thought. Um, the Buddha was said to have a, a mind like an elephant, which just could it just turn, if the Buddha looked at somebody or put his attention on, some, on something or somebody, it just turned. And it's like his whole being just looked at this person, really took them in or, the, you know, really turned towards something. So you could say it's like the whole of his being was fully there, fully behind something. So the mind of the Buddha was like an elephant, whereas you know, our distracted mind is more like a butterfly. You could just, you know, just Those two images say a lot for me, the difference between somebody who's very, very present and mindful um, and somebody who's very distracted. So how, you know, how do we become more like the Buddha? How do we become more mindful in the moment? So we're going to practice through these three dimensions of awareness. So I want to just talk a little bit, very briefly, about how I do this from moment to moment, just in meditation and outside of meditation. So the root, the root of mindfulness, the most, or the, the starting place for the practice of mindfulness is the body, mindfulness of the body. So you'll notice every meditation we start with a body scan, just really cultivating awareness of your body, being in the body. Um, because if you're not in the body, then for me, I can't practice mindfulness. I haven't got mindfulness of the body. There's no chance for me. I'm just away with Papantra. I'm away with the stories. I'm lost in a train of thought. I'm up, caught up in my emotions. Um, so if you're, if you're in the body, it's like an anchor. It's like it's rooting you, grounding you to the earth, grounding you into the, what's happening right now. And it's going to stop you from being yeah, spun away into trains of thought, into stories. So basically, the aim is to be continuously aware of your body the whole time, just continuously aware of your body, if possible. I was on a retreat recently with Vasantra, and he said, well, all the time he tries to keep about 15% of his awareness in his belly. And he got us to try that, so you might try that whilst I'm speaking. He just had, he just had took his awareness, he said, take your awareness into your belly, and just feel like you've got a great, big, warm, relaxed belly. And just try and have that all the time, just try and have that sense of your belly all the time. Um, so you can experiment with that and try that. But I find it's just, yeah, for me, it's essential. If, I've, if I haven't got awareness of the body, I've got no chance of trying to capture my thoughts, my actions, anything else. And I was fortunate in some ways. It seems fortunate. And at the time, it didn't seem fortunate. But I had quite a, a serious back injury. It caused me loads of pain, loads of nerve pain. And it meant, I, for a long time, just had to be really aware of my posture, really aware of my back, which made me really aware of my body. Um, and as a fruit of that, you know, my, I, I really value and appreciate being able to be with my body and, and not respond, not react. So very quickly, what's translated, what the, the Buddhist word Vedana, it means essentially if your experience is pleasant or unpleasant, 
or a kind of shade of pleasant or shade of unpleasant or mixture. And all the time, we've got physical sensations of things going on, and this is a shade of it being pleasant or unpleasant. And that really affects our emotions, it affects our moods, our states, our actions. So if we can bring mindfulness to whether it's a bit like the, the barefoot treading on different surfaces, there's going to be a shade, a tinge of pleasantness or unpleasantness to our experience all the time. But if we're aware of that, we don't necessarily need to act from that you know, in, in a reactive way. So we bring awareness to what, what's, you know, is it pleasant or unpleasant, what's happening right now? So I haven't got time to go into lots of depth about these, lots of details, I'm going to explain them briefly to you. The Buddhist word chitta means thoughts and emotions, it means our heart and mind. Buddhists don't separate heart and mind like we do in the West, it's one faculty called chitta, and it, it cap, uh, encapsulates thoughts, emotions, desires, impulses, volitions, it's all chitta. So this is a real, this is the kind of Apamada territory. You know, we've, kind of, we've got ourselves grounded in the body, and then we're in danger of being lost in papancha, lost in trains of thoughts and stories, getting caught up in our heated emotions, our anger, whatever it is, our jealousy, our craving. This is all going on in chitta. So, you know, having established mindfulness of the body and Vedana, we start to become aware of our trains of thoughts, our impulses, our emotions. This is all chitta. And papancha, we were talking about this in the team meeting. You could see papancha for me really well illustrated with Facebook, actually, or something like that on the internet. You end up going into Facebook maybe just to check a message or to contact a friend or something like that. And then suddenly you see a really interesting thing pops up on the thread. So you follow that and then you click on that and you get taken to a link about something else. Then you click on that and then there's a video about cats or something like that. And you click on that. And before you know it, you've just spent an hour and you've just got lost in this kind of train of video links or images or threads, whatever it is. And the same thing's happening internally in our mind all the time. You know, we're getting lost... We start off with you know, an intention to do one thing, but then something else pops up in our mind, we get carried away by that, and that leads to another thought. So it could be, you know, you start thinking about the intention to get ready for work, then you think, oh, I'm going to see that colleague at work, oh, I had that argument with them yesterday. Then you start to get angry, oh, I can't believe they said that, and you know, they, they, they've been doing this all the time, you get to get lost in this story. So you find that, yeah, our emotions and our thoughts just kind of feed each other, we get caught in this perpancha loop. So this is where we practice Apamada and the gap. And the way we do this is you need to unhook, unhook from the stories, unhook from the trains of thought, and just return back to your experience in the body. This is what I try and do in meditation. Is, so I get lost in a train of thought. I just imagine unhooking from that train of thought, just trying to return. If I've got lost, usually if that's happened, I've lost my sense of the body. Just return to the body, really become grounded again in the body. Um, sometimes that's enough, other times it's a really powerful emotion, so I need to just feel the emotion actually. So mindfulness doesn't mean not feeling, this is, a, this is a danger, this is a danger that I fell into, a trap I fell into when I first started to practice mindfulness. I thought being a block of wood and you know, practicing vigilance meant that I don't experience emotions. And that was quite attractive to me because I didn't like emotions at the time, I was quite pretty blocked. There's a lot of emotions I was frightened of. There's a lot of emotion I kind of locked away, didn't want to experience, kind of grief, sadness, anger. So I thought, oh, great, I can practice mindfulness. I don't have to experience any of it. That's really attractive. But being a block of wood doesn't, you know, it's a danger you could interpret as not experiencing, not feeling what's there. And this can be a trap called alienated awareness, where we're kind of we're aware of what's happening, but we're not really, we're not really fully with it. We're not feeling it. We're a bit kind of separated from ourselves in a way, what we really feel, what's really going on. And this is a trap that I fell into. So actually when you're practicing mindfulness, I'm going to hook from the stories of Papancha, but I still allow myself to feel whatever's there in a way, without getting caught up in the stories, without getting caught up in the, you know, without acting on the impulse. In meditation, I, I can, it's a real practice ground for allowing myself to experience what's there without acting on it, without getting carried away with the stories. The second danger with practicing all of this is that you just get a bit stuck in your own stuff, really. You get just become really internalised. You think, okay, well, it's all about my mindfulness, my mental states, my experiences, my conditions, my interesting psychological stuff that's going on. It becomes all about me and my stuff, in a way. And so, yes, um, Sangha Rakshita, for this reason, 
I believe, introduced these two other aspects of awareness, others and the environment, our kind of surroundings. So if I'm practicing mindfulness off the cushion and I'm unhooking from stories and papancha, I need to, and I need to become more with what's happening, it actually means becoming more aware of the people around me rather than my stories about them, my ideas about them. Um, yeah, just actually becoming aware of them, the other people. So other people really are a mystery. We don't know them. We can't, we can't get inside another person's mind or brain. It's a complete mystery what's happening. But we think we know people. We think we understand them. We've got very clear ideas about what they're like. But actually, if we're going to be really aware of them, we need to kind of drop all our stories, all our ideas, and just be open, be open to them as people who are a bit of a mystery, actually. So, yeah, if we get stuck in papancha and distraction off the cushion, usually what we need to do is return to our body and just become open to the person that we're with, we're meeting, we're, we're, we're talking with, we're, we're, we're working with. Yeah. And then, yeah, lastly, well, second to lastly, environment. Another way, if we're, you know, if we're not with people, or even if we are with people, it might be possible just to kind of take in your surroundings more, become more and more aware of your surroundings. When you're kind of really stuck in your anger or your jealousy or craving or your train of thought, your stories, often, more often than not, we're not really taking in our environment, our surroundings. And there's so much kind of pleasure and beauty and yeah, enjoyment to be had in just the simple pleasures of taking in your, your surroundings, your environment. And so it might be uh, taken in nature around you, plants, trees, flowers. I mean, spring's a brilliant time for being more aware of your surroundings. There's so much beauty, so many. The rhododendrons at the moment are amazing. A few weeks ago, it was the blossoms, and before that, the magnolia trees. Just becoming aware of the, the beauty. It might be, you know, there's a play of light, just light flickering on different things around you. It could be very, very beautiful to take in. The breeze, sounds. So, yeah, unhooking from the stories in our... Yeah, our, our kind of heated emotions, whatever it is. We can, we can become aware of other people and we can become aware of our surroundings, our environment. Yeah. And, yeah, the simple pleasures become more and more... Yeah, we just start to enjoy the simple things in life more, take pleasure in the simple things of life more. So through that, we, we become aware of beauty and we have a mind which, as Ratnaguna was saying, creates beauty. We become more beautiful, actually. An aware mind is a beautiful mind. So yeah, so eventually what you could find on the cushion and off the cushion is the kind of chitter settles down, the kind of thoughts and emotions become calmer, they become more settled, they become more and more positive, more and more beautiful. And yeah, when the mind settles and the heart settles down, well, what can happen is we become more aware of reality, we become more aware of the truth. This can mean a number of things. It could mean in a situation you're more aware of a particular practice that you need to apply, you know, being aware of the Dharma, what teaching do I need to apply right now? It could also mean that when your mind settles down, you, you, you see the truth more, your mind sees more clearly, you become more aware of the impermanence of things, that comes to mind. Um, yeah, you become more aware, rather than trying to control change, you start to appreciate change, you start to really appreciate change, you see it as being beautiful, being poignant. So the seasons, again, is another way of really starting to uh, enjoy change, rather than trying to control it all the time. And ultimately, yeah, if your mind really settles down, well, what can happen is you can have flashes of reality. You can, you can experience reality directly. You can see it directly. And this, of course, is what happened to the Buddha as he was seated underneath the Bodhi tree two and a half thousand years ago. It said he was practicing the mindfulness of breathing at the time. And basically, he saw reality directly. He became, he became aware of reality directly um, yeah, through his practice of mindfulness. So that's the pinnacle, that's the, the ultimate aim of Bodhisattvas. Um, but I want to just read, to fight to end, just two verses from Shantideva. One I've already read and one's just a, a new one. So there's this, yeah, this um, very beautiful evocation of how we can behave um, when we're mindful of other people, mindful of our environment. So having mastered our lower nature in this way, we should give up frowning and always have a smiling face. Being the first to greet people and talk to others. A friend to the universe. We should speak kindly and look straight at people's faces as if drinking them in with our eyes. 
And finally, uh, Shantideva ends this chapter by saying, in brief, mindfulness means observing the body and the mind at every moment. We need to actually put this into practice and not just talk about it. So he's talking to me as well. When we're sick, what use is it just to read a medical textbook? We need to actually put this into practice and not just talk about it. Yeah. So let's do that. Let's put mindfulness into practice. I've talked about it enough now, I think. <laughs>